thank you very much. Um, not quite sure how to. Okay. So yes, I'm Casimir Warzinski. I work in the AI Products Group at Intel. I'm based in San Diego. I'm very happy to be here at, at Cyber Week. It's great to see some old friends in the audience and, and new friends I've made this week. So today I want to talk to you about a topic that's very dear to my heart and I think hopefully relevant for this audience is privacy-preserving machine learning. So this is my uh, AI is great slide. So, uh, you know, we live in these amazing times where we can do things with AI systems like we can unlock our phones with our faces. Our doctors can detect diseases at earlier stages than ever before. Uh, we can translate text from any one language to any other language automatically. But it's important to keep in mind that these AI systems are, are often built on machine learning. These machine learning systems rely and are shaped by data that's increasingly private and sensitive. So I think that as a field, uh, as an industry, and I would argue as a society, we have to find ways to simultaneously unlock all of this power of AI while still respecting and, and protecting data privacy. Now privacy is a, is a big word, so let's unpack it a little bit here. So what are current approaches to privacy in the context of machine learning? Um, let's split it into kind of two major pillars here. So one pillar is what I would call user control. So typically we want to give users rights around their data. We want to give, you know, users may say, I want the right to know who's collecting data about me for how long, for what purpose, can I opt out, et cetera. So for example, when you surf the web and you click on a, an ad for red shoes and then every single website that you visit after that is also showing you more ads for red shoes, that's probably not the, the behavior that you desired. So that's a bit of a breakdown of, of user controls. There's a lot of very interesting problems in that domain. I'm actually going to spend more time on the other pillar uh, of privacy with respect to ML, and that's data protection. So data protection has two components generally. It's, uh, you know, we want to anonymize data and we want to encrypt data. And currently with respect to ML, both of these components have some gaps that we need to address. So around anonymization, you know, we're learning now that it's not enough to just cross out names and addresses and think that data can't be tied back to their original owners. It's much easier to de-anonymize data than ever before. And then around encryption, you know, we're getting better at encrypted, encrypting data when it's at rest or we encrypt data typically when it's in transit. But because we're doing machine learning, because of the nature of machine learning, we actually need to operate on the data. And so that means typically we have to decrypt the data at some point to operate on it and that creates a new vulnerability. So we kind of, we need additional protections on both of these fronts. But another gap or, or way at which I think we could do better where at the intersection of privacy and machine learning has to do with the idea of trust. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's first keep in mind that the data that we're dealing with and the models, these are digital assets, right? And whenever you share a digital asset with someone, it's completely equivalent to just giving it to them plus trusting them not to do something that you didn't intend with it. Now we add to that fact the, an additional fact, which is that machine learning is fundamentally a multi-stakeholder computation. So what do I mean by that? In a machine learning situation, you'll typically have multiple entities wanting to work together. You'll have one entity that owns training data, another set of folks may own the inference data, someone else may be providing a machine learning service that this is running on, uh, the inference may be performed by a model and that model is owned by someone else and it's running on infrastructure that came from some very long supply chain. So there's a lot of parties involved. And because of this property of digital data, all of these entities have to trust each other in a very complex web and this, this web of trust is becoming increasingly unmanageable. So instead, what if, let's just imagine a world where um, parties who don't necessarily trust each other, can they still come together and, and do machine learning and unlock all of those benefits of AI? So if we could, then, then you could do things like maybe banks who are otherwise rivals in the marketplace, they may decide jointly, 
hey, let's get together and take our private customer data, let's not share it with each other, but can we jointly build a model of money laundering? Or in the healthcare field, you could have a hospital that takes a patient scan and you know, they have their local radiologist who comes up with one diagnosis, but they may say, can we get maybe a second opinion or a third opinion from some really highly trained AI systems out there that could maybe tell us something even more? But we need a way to do that without, um, while still respecting the privacy of that, of that patient's data. So how do you do that? And then finally in retail, um, if, if you could somehow find ways for untrusted parties to do machine learning together, you could enable the monetization of retail data in a way that kind of has um, explicit and quantitative guarantees about the, the privacy of the users who contributed those data. And these three use cases that I just kind of picked out of these three, in, three industries, these three industries in the US make up about a quarter of the economy. So there's a lot of value to be unlocked, potentially, if we can, if we can accomplish this. And I'm, I'm kind of excited by the fact that there are now emerging techniques where we're going to be able to do this, hopefully. And they're, they're collectively known as privacy-preserving machine learning techniques. They, they use tricks from cryptography and statistics. And like many things in cryptography and statistics, they kind of they appear to have magical properties. So let me run you through some of the examples. So for example, it is possible for a, a group of, you know, for, for separate entities to collectively train a machine learning model by pooling their data but without explicitly having to share it with each other. And that can be accomplished using federated learning or multi-party computation. In another trick of magic, it turns out that it is possible to do machine learning on data that are encrypted and that stay encrypted throughout. And that's a technique known as homomorphic encryption. And then finally, on the, on the disclosure side, it is possible to uh, come up with a way of doing math on data sets in such a way that the output of your math can't be tied back to the presence or absence of any individual in that data set. And that's a technique known as differential privacy. And all of these techniques can be further amplified by hardware and software-based uh, techniques known as uh, trusted execution environments. So these are kind of some building blocks of what I call privacy-preserving machine learning. Typically, in a, in a real use case, you're going to take these building blocks and combine them in various ways. So I'm going, to, I'm going to lead you through an example of how you may build a bigger system out of these components. So let's consider the example where you have a bank. And they say, you know what, we need a model that, that detects fraud. When somebody comes in with a transaction, I need to know if this is fraudulent or not. So they'll go to uh, an AI company, let's say, and they'll say, hey, can you build us a model for fraud? And the AI company will say, well, you know, we have these brilliant data scientists here, but we, we need data to build this model. We don't have the data that, that is required. So what they could do is say, well, th there are these retailers who they have, you know, individually they have pools of data that could be used towards this problem. Let's use federated learning to jointly build a model out of their data without actually seeing their data. So you would start out with some initial version of the model that goes out to all of the members of this federation. They all use their private data to make some improvements to that model. And then they send their improvements back to the AI company, which then aggregates these improvements, comes up with a new version of the model, and then sends that out again for further improvements. These improvements to the model that come in, they actually do leak some information about the underlying data. So this aggregation process, you'd want to do it in, in some kind of secure way. One way to do that is using a, a trusted execution environment at, at the AI company. Another thing to, to be mindful of when building a, a, a machine learning model is that particularly when they have a lot of capacity, when they're, when they're very rich models, there's the danger that they can learn, they can memorize certain aspects of the data that they were trained on. And that's not good because then somebody who has that model could potentially extract that information later. So to prevent that from happening, you can use these differential privacy techniques 
at the training, during the training process, where you add a little bit of noise to everybody's data to prevent the model from overfitting that. Okay, so now we've got our, our model, and the bank could say, that's great. Now, AI company, can you please host this model for us? I want to send you a transaction, and then you're going to tell us whether it's fraud or not. But this individual transaction, that data is very sensitive. This is somebody's credit card number or some individual purchase. So to enable that use case, you can use homomorphic encryption to encrypt the transaction, send it over to be processed purely in the encrypted domain. When the answer comes back, it's the encrypted version of the answer that only the bank can then unlock. And then if you wanted to get kind of super fancy, you could say, hey, this uh, federated learning trick that you told me about, one thing that I might not want is the fact that the members of the federation can see potentially the model that they're training, and I might not want them to see the model. I only want to kind of borrow their data, but I don't want them to learn about the model. And so you can use techniques like multi-party computation to keep, to keep that separated too. So for the rest of the talk, so those are kind of the, the privacy-preserving ML building blocks uh, in, a, in a use case. I want to spend the rest of the talk kind of drilling down a little bit more in, this, in one of them, which is homomorphic encryption, and tell you about some of the work that my team has been doing to, 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 to build on that technology. So just as a reminder, uh, homomorphic encryption is this idea where the, the data scientist can take her data, encrypt it, send it out to some machine that she may or may not trust, and then when the answer comes back, it's the encrypted version of the answer that she wanted. How can we enable developers and data scientists to, to use this technology? As I've currently described it, a potential data scientist would say, okay, great, now I have to be an expert in cryptography, uh, you know, computer engineering, and data science, like, you know, as if data science itself weren't hard enough. So our approach has been to kind of leverage the fact that uh, there's already a set of issues in the deep learning community around the fact that we want to make uh, expressing certain deep learning computations easy for developers. So how can we kind of leverage some of that infrastructure to make, to, en to enable these crypto techniques for, for data scientists? So you've, you may have heard of things like TensorFlow, PyTorch, these are kind of these high level languages in which data scientists like to express their ideas. And so we, uh, my team took this idea of a, of a compiler that kind of translates from one language into another to make it so that a data scientist can just do their normal data scientist and then they say, okay, translate what I've done into this homomorphic encryption language and please just have it run. And so that's a project that we, we created called HE Transformer that's an open source that you can go out and download. Just to give you some sense of what's the state of homomorphic encryption technology, I think for those of you who may have heard of it, um, you know, one of the challenges there is that it requires significantly more computation than ordinary, uh, you know, kind of processing clear text data. So how, you know, many orders of magnitude of, of performance have been uh, improved over the last five years, especially just over the last two years. So to kind of give you a state, a snapshot of where things are, um, you can do this MNIST task now, which is, you know, d uh, identifying handwritten digits uh, using, you know, less than a millisecond of time to, to operate on encrypted data. And you've heard some references today already to this ImageNet image task, which is kind of what kicked off the whole deep learning revolution in 2012. We're now at the point where um, we can process, so these images that you're seeing there are, are half the size of the regular ImageNet images in each dimension, but we're still able to process them order of, in, on the order of 50 milliseconds each. So, the, you know, there is an additional computational burden using some of these techniques, but the benefits, the, the privacy benefits that they confer, we think will, um, will make these things increasingly practical and, and, and at some point maybe even demanded by, by certain users. So in conclusion, um, I'm excited about the fact that these big 
important fields of AI and privacy which seem to be a bit on, on, a, on a collision course or at least some kind of tension fundamental between them, uh, they need not, it need not be a zero-sum game. So progress in AI does not have to come at the expense of privacy. Now having said that, there, there is no single technology that kind of solves privacy. So I want to dispel this notion. We still have a lot of work to do as developers, as, you know, as you know, regulators, as users to kind of map out exactly how we want these things to work, but there is tremendous innovation in this space. And one of the areas that we're working in particular is how do we make this in innovation more performant, you know, make it work better computationally, because you know, we're Intel, that's kind of what we do. But also how do we make it usable and accessible to the, to the broader world? So, thank you. <laughs>